All right, this is Bo Turner from 757 Makerspace, and today we're going to look at the Maker's Toolbox with Nathan from Tamarack Axe and Leatherworks. Nathan, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm having a great night. Excellent. How are you guys holding up with the pandemic, being isolated? Pretty good. It's a lot of schoolwork and a lot of random leather projects lately, mostly for awesome. family and friends. Before the pandemic, we were talking leather and making all kinds of fantastic products. And this is one that I had gotten from Nathan at the time, complete with pockets, field node guide inside of here, pin holder, and more. And I think we'll talk a little bit about how all that works, including how to get things like that right on there. For you guys, I have a quick PowerPoint. I'll talk off of it um, just to give people different viewpoints. Uh, Cause you might not be able to see everything I have on my camera. Um, and if you guys have any questions, feel free to chat them in um, or maybe ask me later. Um, I'm very reachable. So just thank you for coming again. Uh, this is going to be a new series with Bo. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone else's tools uh, toolbox. This is my basic setup. I uh, started off with an Amazon beginner's kit. If you guys are... Thinking about getting into leather, it's a really affordable option. And a lot of the tools are still really durable and I still have them in my kit and I'll show you them later. Um, going to the right a little bit, you'll see my organizer tray. That's where I put most of my tools. And I try to live out of that because I'm very mobile with my leather working. Um, and a lot of my like most used tools are in there. So I have all of my edging tools, which would be this guy and my burnisher. And then I have all my cutting implements. I really enjoy a good sharp implement. So I always have multiple in case somehow I end up with a dull one. Um, and then the other big one that I would recommend starting off with is your blunted needles. Uh, you don't need a sharp needle to sew leather because you're gonna pre-punch all your holes. Um, <clears throat> so to show you, I'll go with the edging stuff first. So this is a edge groover. Uh, so what it's gonna do is it's gonna take off just a slight little um, piece of leather on the edges and it allows you to burnish them um, and what burnishing is is it's the process of heating up and using friction to kind of glaze the edge of leather and it gives it a really nice finished look um, it's going to look something like this so it kind of gives you a sheen and all it is is just some friction and it a little bit of elbow grease goes a long way with that and it really gives it a finished look. Um, the other big thing I use in my toolbox is going to be my awl. Um, that was on my little list. Uh, I use my awl for everything. You can punch holes with it. You can mark with it. Um, it's really indispensable. Uh, I think out of my kit, my two biggest things I care about are my awl and my straight edge. Uh, or not my straight edge, my sharp knife. Uh, so I use a number 11 craft tool for a lot of my smaller, thinner leathers. And for my heavyweight leathers, I use a utility knife. Um, utility knives are great. They're not pretty. There's a lot of really expensive, pretty options for leather work. But getting started, these are what I would recommend. Um, just because they're cheap, they're, um, you can sharpen them, but they're relatively uh, low barrier to entry. Um, so I'd really look at that route if you guys are interested in this. The next thing I care about and I use a lot is my metal straight edge. Um, I use it to mark, but I also use it to guide my cuts. And the reason I want a metal one is when you're cutting through the leather, you want to butt up against it. And if you have like a wooden one or a plastic one, just the risk of nicking your ruler um, can really mess up the edge of your leather. And it's not too expensive to go this route. I um, actually found this one just in my school supplies kit from forever ago. So there's really no added cost there. Um, another big thing I use with my toolkit is a cheap Harbor Freight wing divider. Um, I use this to set my glue lines and my stitch lines. Um, so, and also to make some more symmetrical like rivet holes and other things just trying to keep everything to look nice and tidy. Um, and then going over into the stitching side, I have my stitching prongs. And this is what I was talking about with pre-punching your holes for sewing leather. Um, unlike cloth, uh, you, you don't have to 
just um you can't just sew through it unless you're really strong and you just want to muscle through it um so they sell stitching prongs they're uh either a flat or diamond shaped chisel and they come in three or four uh or two four and six prongs um and it's really useful to have at least a six and a two and that's just so you can get your straight edges and then work your way around the corners with the two prongs. Um, once you get a hole, it'll um, allow you to pass your thread through um, with minimal effort. Um, you're gonna saddle stitch, and I can talk about that later, um, but the saddle stitch is gonna be used with one thread and two needles. And I use a pretty generic harness needle and it's it's got a slight tip to it I don't know if you guys can see that very well on this camera but uh, they're a little bit sturdier than your standard sewing needle and they're not as sharp and it really is easy they pass right through um, and whatever gauge wire um, not wire uh, thread you use will depend on how hard it goes through the leather um, some of the more other more important things I use are some sort of of adhesive. I know people with latex allergies um, can't necessarily use or don't like to use uh, cements. So you can use a typical like white glue, like a kind of like your Elmer's, but they do make leather specific uh, white glues. But I like to use a cement because it's a little bit more permanent, a little bit more uh, water resistant, and it'll keep the hole hold. Um, all of my connections are usually a uh, glue base with a stitch going through it. So it's gonna be durable either way, but I like to have that little added uh, security since a lot of my stuff uh, goes on into elements and gets beat up. So I use and really recommend barge. It sets up really nice. And in conjunction with the barge, um, you can get these beautiful little glue spreaders from Tandy Leather. Uh, I got like a package of 10 for a couple bucks. Uh, this is the only one I've used so far, so that package of 10 is going a really long way. Um, I use a little glue eraser, or some of you guys might know this as like your sandpaper eraser, just to clean up the glue on it at the end of the day. Um, and it really helps extend the life of the tool I already have. Um, the other thing I've used a little bit is like a, a weld bond uh, or weld wood from uh, Ace Hardware. This works great too. Uh, you just have to let it cure a little longer because it's a little thinner of a, a cement, but it does work. So just play with what you guys um, use normally and see how it works for your leather and how you like to work with things. But if you already have barge or some sort of cement, I'd really recommend that route. And the last thing for tools and kind of generic uh, like shop items that I carry and I like you kind of go through a lot of is thread. So there's a lot of different options with thread. Uh, you have different thicknesses, different materials. Um, you can have waxed or non-waxed. Um, for myself, I started off and I got this with the beginner's kit. It's a, it's a pretty generic um, woven, kind of like not quite braided, but it's pretty similar um, wax polyester thread. Um, this works really great. It kind of lubricates itself going through the stitching, but it also kind of gives it a little bit of a waterproofing on the edge and it cleans up really nice. And you can also melt it and it locks itself in and it looks really clean that way. Um, and this is a really great spot to begin with. I know a lot of people that use it still. And I actually, for some of my, my like sheets, I still use it because it's a little bit thicker, gives it a little bit more um, strength. Uh, but I've since switched to what's called a uh, Reitza Tiger Thread. Um, and it's on my, PowerPoint, and I'll come back to it in a little bit. But uh, they have some really beautiful colors. So the screen is lying to you. This is actually, this first one's a purple. Um, this one's a yellow and uh, just a standard black. Um, Reitza has a really good coloring system and they kind of show you what it matches to for other like leather brands. Um, they offer it in four different thicknesses from 0.6 millimeters up to 1.2 millimeters. For a lot of your like heavier weight stuff, like a sheath or a backpack or some sort of like belting system, you might end up somewhere near a 1.2 millimeter. Um, but for like wallets and small goods, 0.8 or 0.6 is going to be um, kind of your sweet spot. Um, 
I tend to use like a 0.1 for most of my sheets just because I it kind of gives me a little bit of flexibility like if I need to pull it over to another project um, but I do carry these three as a 0.8 um, for my wallet since I do a lot of them this is my current setup um, so I carry a lot of the tools and stuff in here um, really can't stress um, organization even if it's just like a kind of a simple thing is really a time saver for most makers. Um, you're not having to search and hunt for everything. Um, but if you guys have any questions on the stuff, definitely ask it at the end. Um, the reason I got into leather work, um, it's kind of funny. I was doing trail work and I still am uh, as a volunteer. Um, but I had a lot of antique axes and antique tools that I picked up along the way. Um, and I really didn't want to pay someone for a $35, like kind of fits some, doesn't fit all sheath. And I mean, they're really good. They're really sturdy. They're at a pretty affordable price for a sheath. Um, and like, it's pretty hardy. I still carry it sometimes with certain axes, but I didn't like how it looked for my stuff because I was restoring them. I was trying to give them some character and give them some love and uh, make it my tool. And in the process of doing that, what I like to do is kind of make my own. And so I started off and as any endeavor goes, you are a little rough at the beginning and you finally make your way. So like looking around the screen, this ax up here on the top left, that is what I call my Sawyer ax. And I have it here as well. It's been beat up. It's not that fresh anymore. I carry this in the woods with me a lot. And so I decided my first leather endeavor would be the sheath for it. As you can tell, it's a little well-worn. The stitching line doesn't look so pretty. I beat it up a lot. Um, I learned a lot from this though, and I was really happy that it turned out usable. And with any endeavor, you have to learn it along the way and kind of nitpick it and learn from each experience, but also love it, you made it. And then I kind of switched over into these guys. This is my Pulaski, I use it for, um, trail building and fire line work. And so I carried this tool so many miles. Uh, it's on a 40 inch hickory handle and I re restored it from the ground up. I bought it on Etsy, um, found it really good. It's an um, antique Kelly True Temper uh, for service Pulaski, um, probably from mid century, sometime, somewhere in there. So this was the second, third-ish iteration of my sheets. And they're getting better. I'm like kind of learning how to do the stitching work and a little bit nicer and kind of plan ahead with that stuff. I, I kind of taught myself by watching YouTube videos and asking people that have done it. And I didn't really have any patterns. Everything I did for patterns was kind of winging it or using uh, just like a piece of paper to kind of sketch it out real quick and then just go for it. And then I started trickling into wallet. I wanted to make a wallet for myself. And so this is a uh, beginning process of my first wallet that I carried for the first year of my leatherworking experience. And it is a hand dyed veg tan. I did it purple because purple is one of my favorite colors and I still have it. I don't use it anymore, but I keep it in my kit just so I can show people where I started and now I'm at. And then I did a lot of keychains and fun things and I carry like a letter stamp kit so I can actually stamp in the letters and kind of customize it. And this is another iteration of a wallet and a buddy let me go ham and kind of play with it. And so that's kind of where I started and what I like to do. And I'm still working with a lot of this stuff and I have it here to show you. So this is a wish list item for me. It's a genuine Norland uh, Hudson Bay Axe. I just love the shape of it. And I had a, a very great friend out in Idaho who sent it to me when I moved back out east, um, along with a couple other Pulaski's. Um, so I'm in the process of putting a new handle on it and um, making a sheath for it. So this is a, one of my newer sheaths, kind of a little bit more streamlined, tried to cut out any random bulk that really didn't need to be there. Um, and I also tried a new technique, I put edge paint on it. So it's dyed on the, on the fronts and all of the visible and interior spaces. But then I went into edge painting it to kind of give it a little bit of a pop color. And I used some um, copper burrs and rivets. Um, it's a really cool system. Uh, you just use it like a little 
um, anvil type system that locks it in and then you just hammer it down after you um, cut it off. So that's kind of where I started and what got me into leather. It's kind of a passion and a secondary, third uh, tertiary hobby that I really enjoy to do. And like some days I'll stay up late and I'll stay stitching or watch TV and stitch just so I can continue doing what I like to do. So currently I'm working on a lot of wallets and field note covers, kind of like what Bo has. I made myself one um, and he was gracious enough to teach me how to use the um, laser engraver so that I could engrave a quote from the Lorax and put my logo onto the front of the field note cover. Um, so that's kind of some of the new things I'm doing. And then I'll show you some of the projects that I've been sent out. So, um, like I said, I do a lot of wallets. So this is at the Makerspace. This is some of the, um, the more diverse group of wallets I've made. Uh, so th these are like your minimalist wallets that a lot of people are getting into now, like trying to carry as little as possible. I made some stash pouches for like rings or jewelry or whatever, like this one might fit an SD card. Um, and some larger bifold wallets that have a money clip. So it has this clip, but no pockets on the clip. And then it has like another pocket or two on the other side. And I can show you that after I talk about the slide. Um, this is another project I did. It's right before I completed it. Um, this is a Pulaski for one of my buddies that's doing firework out in Wyoming. It's a 40 inch handle. Um, it's hickory. It's from a guy down in um, Tennessee. And I custom fit it to the head. And this is a newer version of my Pulaski. And I did um, the forest green and copper uh, hardware just to kind of get some pop. And then I have a friend from New York that had a throwing ax, a uh, double bit ax. And she wanted some sort of double sheath that has a connector so that it didn't get lost. And so this is two separate sheets that button together with a strap in the back. Um, so you can have the strap or you can remove it. And then this is Bo's um, field note cover. Uh, I'm slowly changing and iterating things. Um, one of the things I do along the way with my projects is I either make a pattern, I buy a pattern, or I tinker with a pattern. Um, so one of my bought patterns are these really beautiful acrylic um, cutouts. They have different shapes and they're all the same dimension, like the same width but they have like this one's rounded with a flat top and like you get all these really cool like swoops and S turns and a V. Um, and so you can kind of play with it. These are really durable and I use them as like edge guides too. So like I can get a straight edge with a, a nice um, radius on the corners. Um, so kind of all of my stuff has a very similar radius to the edge, um, the corners because I use all of the same tools for that. Um, I've also made a lot of my own uh, card stock um patterns and so this is for a cast iron handle cover and i've just made the same one but for a slightly smaller cast iron and i just make them out of either cardboard or um i think this is an index card that's been laminated with um some regular packing tape and then one of the companies i would recommend for patterns is make supply i love his work he has a lot of free ones that you can use in a business situation but also you can buy a lot of really beautiful ones. Like this is an early version of that bifold wallet. So this is part of the template. And then that turns into this beautiful wallet. So a good first project in all reality is that keychain. So I'll pop that back up. Um, so this keychain, it took me maybe an hour and a half, two hours after my first or second attempt. Um, and that's like just trying to play with the template and like get the stitching right and glue it up and all that. Um, so that's a pretty easy entry level project. Um, these wallets I think would take me at the beginning like around four hours just because I hand dyed it all. Um, and so these projects were a little bit more time intensive and that's why I've kind of moved to pre-dyed leather for wallets because wallets are small. You can't spend that much time on them um, if you're going to make them affordable to who you're selling them to. 
Um, whereas like a sheath like this, though it's a very reasonable uh, early project. Um, it, you can be proud of this. I'm very proud of this. I still use those sheaths. And um, I think the whole set from like figuring out the design to dyeing and cutting and like final assembly took me about eight hours, but that was my first or second attempt at it. So that takes some time. Um, but don't be discouraged by the time because that was all with dyed leather. So the dye time adds a lot of fluff time in there. So it's not really hands-on doing the project for eight hours solid. Um, whereas like something like this, um, Bo's Field Note Journal, if you want to jump straight into something like that, from marking your leather to having it completely finished and edged, I would say if you're getting good at it, it could probably take about an hour and a half to two hours. And the only reason I say that is this model is a lot of stitching. Um, there's a lot of stitch lines on these field note covers. So there's like two hidden stitch lines under here. You have your interior one, which you have to do before you attach the back panel to the front panel. And then you have the two large U-shaped stitch lines. Um, I found that the only place I can't cut time right now um, because I hand stitch is the stitching. Okay, so another question is your, your work has color in it. How do you make the leather color? Do you, meant, um, do you use dye? So I do use dye, but I also use pre-dyed stuff. Um, they have various types of dye. They have um, gel-based, which is a little bit more like a petroleum product. They have water-based and alcohol-based dyes. Uh, they also have antiquing gel, so you can take like just a plain, um, plain color um, piece of leather and kind of darken it a little bit. So I, when I do do a project like this purple one, um, I use an EcoFlow water-based um, dye, and it's from Tandy. Uh, you can get a, a lot of really great colors from Tandy. Um, you can also paint leather. There's a really great company called uh, Angel Angelo's, and it's a uh, leather paint. Um, so all you have to do is kind of prime it and then paint it, and you can do all sorts of colors with it. On the other end of the spectrum, if you're not ready to spend the time dyeing or you don't really want to mess around with getting your hands turned all sorts of weird colors, you can go to the pre-dyed route. Um, and that's what I've done for a lot of my small goods, just because it's a time saver and you get some really good colors and good textures. Um, and that kind of ties into like the leather tights. Um, so like I have a, a beautiful olive drab, I have like a, a light brown. Um, and this is the same type of leather, just a different dye, uh, dye process. And then I have like a butter o, which is a black wax. And then I have a bridal blue. Um, so it kind of allows you to, like if you shop the market, you can find the colors that you want. There's a lot of great patterns out there now. Um, there's some folks that offer like a ghosted camo or like a true camo. Um, there's like patterns that can be embossed into leather from the tannery. So I'll kind of talk a little bit about leather just because it all kind of gets jumbled in with the coloring. Um, so there's a lot of variants to leather. Um, so you have two basic categories, which is like a chrome tan and then a, a vegetable tan. So chrome tan is using some sort of chromium salts to tan leathers. That's gonna be a lot of your softer and cheaper leather, not cheaper as in like bad quality, but it's gonna be a lower price point just because it's a faster process. So they can pump out a lot more of it. Um, and that's using a lot of your garments, um, like leather jackets it's a lot more supple it gives um it like feels really nice when you put it on and then on the opposite end of that you have vegetable tan which is um they use tannins from like oaks and other plants to tan the the leather and so this is what it will come out if they don't add any dyes to it but then they can also add in like a black and um or just like a slight brown and with the coloring um, and like the textures that come in with the leather, a lot of that has to do with what else they're adding in on the tanning process. So like this is a vegetable tan um, and it's waxy. It's kind of got a really nice top finish. 
And a lot of that comes into like all the extra waxes that they add in after it's been dyed and tanned. Um, and like this leather, uh, I know you guys can't really see the texture or feel the texture, um, but it's been kind of like hit with sandpaper is the best way to put it. And um, so it's not shiny, it's matte, um, kind of gives it a little bit more of a rustic look. So looking at the leather, you can kind of go anywhere from just a uh, natural all the way to like all these beautiful, deep, rich colors. Um, and under the vegetable tan, uh, that's a very durable and hardy leather. Um, so like a lot of your sheets, your wallets, um, like horse tack and saddle tack are made with a vegetable tan. It's going to be a bridal leather, which is a subcategory of vegetable tan. And it's a very durable and very useful leather. As far as like places to get leather, there's a lot of great resources on like Tandy and Weaver. Um, if you guys are looking to get started into leather, I would really recommend those guys just because they carry everything and a lot of their stuff is a low entry, like low point of entry. You're not spending too much money on something if you're just trying to learn. Um, they have a lot of great economy leather. Um, it's good quality, but it's also not a $200 for a half a hide. Um, I found while shopping, there's a lot of really great um, leather brands out there, but some of them, just because the processes that they do and like the prestige that they have um, are pricey. So like um, the bridal leather in this is gonna be a, a bunch more than the Italian um, Badalsi Carlo um, Pueblo leather. So like, for instance, this is about, 12 to 13 dollars a square foot um and this is about 30 ish so it kind of really depends on what you guys are trying to do and like what you guys are trying to get into with the leather um and that's like the biggest thing is like kind of guide what you're buying to what you're trying to get out of it so if you're trying to make a really nice piece of garment you're going to want to go that chrome tan route Whereas if you're trying to make a sheath, go the bed chain route. And there's a lot of really great resources on um, online. I use a lot of YouTube to start out and a lot of um, just form hunting, uh, trying to figure out what I, what route I wanted to go and kind of what is a really good beginner leather. Um, like Herman Oak, they're a really solid veg tan supplier. Um, so most of my sheets I get Herman Oak, it's, they have different, categories of the craftsmen they have their prestige levels and they're pretty good about being affordable to most people i guess some other tools that i would recommend if you guys are looking to get into it and that i do use a lot of is a simple piece of uh, granite countertop so you can actually get like i got this one for free i got it i went over to the counter top shop and i asked to go through their garbage and they're like, yeah, no problem. And like, I told them what I was doing with it and why I wanted it. And they let me just pick out whatever is a good size. Um, this is a little over a foot by like maybe eight inches. And it's really solid and it helps backing for like when you're punching or you're trying to um, like set a rivet. Um, so there's a lot of those like little things. Another thing that I got recently that I really love and most people may or may not have is like a self-healing cutting mat. Um, I started off and I still use it a lot with like just like a generic like polypropylene or whatever it is, uh, plastic cutting board from like Dollar Tree. I've beaten the heck out of it. I still use it. Um, but because the way it's made, you get like a, kind of like a serrated cut because of the bumps in the cutting board. Whereas a self-healing mat, um, it never hangs up on my cut ed cutting edge and it um, takes a beating, but it, it's a little pricier. And when I finally jumped into it, I'm very happy that I got it. Um, but it was kind of a little bit of a frivolous buy because uh, I could have made it with the other one. Another big piece of machinery, and I'll have to go grab it, is my Arbor Press. I use it most every time I make a project just because I use it to set all of my stamps. Um, so I use little brass stamps to emboss my maker's mark. 
Um, so I got these from a guy out in California. He um, used a th uh, CNC machine to cut them. And because they're so small and they have a lot of detail, you can't strike it with a hammer and get the, the imprint to look really nice because um, you might overstrike or hit it multiple times and it could kind of wander on you. Um, but as far as the Arbor Press, I went the cheapest route possible and I got this from Harbor Freight. Um, I haven't made any modifications to it and I don't really think I will in the long run. Uh, but for most of the stuff I do, it's just putting a stamp into a leather. And for I think less than a hundred bucks, I have a really nice piece of kit. Um, yeah, so I guess one last thing to show you guys um, before I get ready for questions is my like recommended tool list and kind of like where I buy things from now and from like when I started. Where I like to buy from, so I still buy a lot of my stuff from Tandy and Weaver, a lot of my tools and like restocking things. Um, and that's for like most of my kit, like my rivets, things that I go through a lot of and I don't really feel the need to spend the high end amount for something that's not an integral part to the product. Whereas like my leather, my, my um, thread, like the things that I really want the highest quality um, piece and like usable thing is gonna be Rocky Mountain Leather Supply and Buckle Guy. Um, they kind of overlap with some of the leather say supply. Um, like uh, my, one of my favorites from Buckle Guy would be the Wicket and Craig bottle leather. Um, it's beautiful, it looks really good, it's really durable. Um, but they don't supply the Badassi Carlo Italian leather that I love as well. Um, and this is what I sell most of because I just, it kind of emanates who I am. It's rustic and that's what I like about it. And it kind of fits my personality. So that's kind of what's guided into my, um, my shop. Um, I also get a lot of like my brass hardware from Buckle Guy. So like a lot of the money clips that I buy are from him. So these are just what I use on those bifold wallets with the money clip in them. They're really simple, but like you can get varying um, degrees of precision and durability depending on who you buy from. Um, like I said, Vidal Sicolo, the, the uh, Pueblo is really awesome. It's rustic, it's pre-dyed. You don't have to do much to it other than sew it and burnish it. Um, I get a really thin leather, um, so it's, Leather is typically measured in either millimeters or ounces. Um, so I use what's like a two and a half to three ounce leather. So it's fairly thin for my small goods, but it's still really strong. And it's really hard to damage um, when you're just putting it in your wallet or using it around the house or whatever. For my heavier weight stuff, I go with the Herman Oak. I go with an eight to nine ounce um, leather. So that's gonna be this really thick piece of leather. And that's all one solid piece. Um, and leather can come up to 30 ounces, depending on what the cow had when it um, was processed. Um, the other thing about Herman Oak is it's not um, pre-dyed unless you want it to be. Um, so I think that usually comes in either a, like a light brown, dark brown, or black, or natural. Um, so I buy it by the half cow, and I get um, undyed. So when I do a sheath, because I do every sheath custom, um, I can do the purples, I can do blues, I can do greens, um, and that's really nice um, leather to work with, and I've been really happy with it, um, and I haven't had any of the products made with it fail on me. Um, the other thing is my thread, so you can, like Amazon or Tandy, they sell like spools of this, um, they just call it the hand stitching thread, it's a wax thread. Um, really inexpensive. If you're just starting out, I'd really go this route. It's going to look fine. It's going to look great. Um, don't be afraid to use it. But like when you're looking to get like finer work, like you're starting to reach that threshold of like trying to look professional, but also like you're really trying to sell a good or like you're, when you're hitting that like uh, mark where you're trying to really push your product up a little bit, um, I'd really go with 
the right side. It's a little bit pricier, but it's really good stuff. And I love that it's um, braided and it's really durable. Um, and then my patterns. Um, so the ones I have purchased have been from Make Supply, um, but you can also find them on Etsy. You can kind of play with them yourself. Um, a lot of my early patterns were me looking at things and just trying to figure out how I would do it. Um, so like I made a tote bag for my girlfriend at the time, or my girlfriend, and it was pretty early into the process and I made it completely just by looking at it and using a paper grocery bag as a template. Like I just kind of flattened it out and traced it on there and kind of tried to get the dimensions right and went from there. Um, so yeah, that's what I have. That's my toolbox um, and kind of my passion and reason for getting into leather. Has there been a life lesson you have learned from, uh, in part from with leather? Um, yes, definitely the old adage, um, measure twice, cut once comes into mind. Um, even like some of the days, like I get so flustered and I just want to like rush through the thing. And then I realize that those are the times where I mess up the most. Um, but also that like patience is key. Like when, anytime I'm dying, like, um, my leather, like I always want to jump in and like, even if it's wet, like I just want to finish it and it's okay to just take a step back and breathe. Um, let, let things progress at their natural pace. Don't, you don't have to rush every project. Um, like it's definitely worth slowing down and taking the time to put in the, the right effort at the right time. Um, so that you're not putting, putting yourself backwards on the timetable. I've ruined a couple projects. Um, like I have a piece of leather here that somehow, like I was rushing, I was trying to do another one and I got a random color and I had to start all over. My dream leather project. Um, let's see. I would really like to make a full size leather sheath for my crosscut saw, but I also really want it to be like a blend of antique but also new and like kind of use all of that fun stuff and like try to build in new te techniques into turning a vintage saw into a new tool but I don't know it's trying to bring it back and give it some life but also give it a lot of a lot of character um, and then on the flip side something a little bit different from what I normally do I really would like to get into like making my own like big leather backpack kind of like a fashion backpack not really like a camping or hiking backpack. So advice for my younger self in leather working, um, I would say do a little bit more research into the tools you wanna buy. Um, so I did like my beginner's kit, but I've realized that I didn't use every tool in it. So like some of the things I've used most is I maybe could have like played with that a little bit more. Uh, so for the laser cutter, um, what we went with, so for the thinner leather, the two to three ounce, um, we used the thin leather setting on the Glowforge and that works out beautifully. It didn't cut too deep and it didn't damage the leather, um, like damage the integrity of the leather. Um, so really the Glowforge has those settings really well set up and even though it's not their their brand of leather, um, it worked fine to use their settings. Um, I think the only thing that we changed for one of ours was on Bo's journal, he had a lot of image to engrave. And so we just kind of played with the speed a little bit and the feed rate, I think. But I don't remember what we put in on Bo's. Um, so the next question is, is it better to spend money on tools to make your work better or spend money more money on nicer leather where's the best um uh, to spend money to get started and what would be a rough budget wise to get started um okay so for starting out i would say spend the money on nicer tools um you're gonna be happier with it if you're really sure you want to do this as a hobby or even like a maybe a, a new business idea for yourself Having nice tools from the get-go or nicer tools, they don't have to be the, the highest end or anything like that. Um, but getting tools that you're really happy with and comfortable with um, and doing your research on that, that's where I'd spend my money because learning to work with leather, it's kind of nice to use a cheaper leather 
to know that you're not sinking a lot of money into it before you're comfortable with what you're doing. Um, so like I have it. Oh, here it is. Um, so like I found this leather, it's a chap leather. It's, um, it's kind of in the chrome tan family. Um, I got it on a really good discount on like a random leather suppliers website and I didn't spend a lot of money on it, but I got a lot of value from learning on the cheaper leather. And I didn't really make a bounce or a switch to more expensive leather until probably my second year of doing leather work. And I'm not regretting that one, one minute because it can get really expensive to, to buy leather depending on what you're doing with it and what you're trying to get out of it. Um, a rough budget to get started. I think with my first leather purchase and all of the tools and like little things, um, not including like my Arbor Press, um, I think I spent around two fifty to three hundred dollars setting up, um, and that's like with a beginner's kit, like organization trays, trying to get all of the doodads, like rivets and button snaps and stuff like that. Um, and all the tools that go with those, which I didn't really talk a lot about because to get started, you don't need them. Um, and I don't use them a whole lot anymore because I don't do too many snaps unless I'm doing a sheet. Um, but yeah, about 250 to $300 is probably where I'd say. Um, but be mindful, like some of the, the custom made or the if you're trying to support another maker, um, their tools are going to be pricier to begin with. So like I've found really beautiful alls um, that could be like 50 bucks, whereas this one's probably two bucks. Really, is there a good starter hatchet for camping that you would recommend to buy? Um, so recommendations for hatchets is really tough. It depends on what you're trying to do with it. If it's just camping, you can get away with a lot of like the cheaper, like East, um, I think it's East Wing hatchets or, um, like a council tools has some really good quality stuff that I really enjoyed. Um, I buy a lot of my stuff vintage. So like if you're somebody that's really into figuring out how to make something or do something, um, I got this ax head for 15 bucks and the handle is another 10 bucks. And then the sheath, I mean, if you have leather already, it's a little bit different. I got this head for 12 bucks, which is sometimes cheaper than buying a whole new one. Um, and the handle, the handle's still about 10 to 20 bucks, depending on what you get and where you get it from. Um, so depends on the person. If you like vintage and you like restoring things, go that route, it's cheaper. And if you like, um, like new things, check out Council Tool, E-Swing. And I think you could also look at Fiskars. They're weird to me. I don't really like them, but they are, they are high quality for what they are. Um, and then. Uh, yeah, so to support my work or find me, uh, I'm on Instagram at Tamrack Axon Leather Works. Um, it's also um, my Facebook. I haven't done too much on Facebook yet with it. Um, but yeah, you can reach me there very easily. Or uh, when things kind of go back to normal, I'm usually at the makerspace pretty frequently, um, hanging out at the big uh, plywood table. So you'll usually see me there. Um, you can also give me an email uh, at tamarackaxeleather at gmail.com and I'll put that in the comments for anyone that's um, able to read them. I'm usually pretty good about getting back to people usually the same day or the next day. Um, so if you have questions or you're interested in my work. Thank you so much for doing that and sharing what's in your toolbox, Nathan. Yeah, thank you for having me and I'm really stoked to be the inaugural Makers Toolbox. This has been a really fun way to go about doing what I do with leather.